Hey everyone, before we begin on these stories, I just want to give a huge thank you to all of the subscribers who have submitted their stories to me. Some of the things you guys have went through are just insane, and I can't even fathom how you were able to overcome them. I just really want to show some respect to you guys for not only being able to go through these horrible experiences, but also being brave enough to open up and talk about them and share them here with my channel. You truly have my respect and appreciation. I've talked to each one of these subscribers personally, and to my knowledge, all of these stories are true. Whether you believe that or not, though, is entirely up to you. If you'd like to share your story with me to be used in a video, please consider submitting your story to me at either my personal subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash southerncannibal or to my email address, which is southerncannibal at gmail.com. Both will be on screen and in the video description as well. All that being said, sit back, relax, and let's begin. And remember, stay hungry. Number 1. I was assaulted a decade ago. Submitted by Dare Fiction. Before I start the story, I'd like to give a bit of backstory. This takes place in Southeast Texas 11 years ago. I was a reckless 21 year old who was constantly putting myself in dangerous situations. Honestly, I'm surprised I haven't gotten myself killed yet. Leading up to this point, I was still living with my mom and stepdad and two younger brothers due to numerous setbacks in my life. Most of them being illegal activity I was partaking in as a teenager such as underage drinking, possession of weed, and drag racing. You get the point. The reason I'm telling you all this is because I need you to understand the type of person I was during the events taking place in this story. On this particular night, I was driving home from a long venture of clubbing with my friend Ray. We were very intoxicated, which yes, I realize how incredibly dumb it was to be drinking and driving. And looking back at it now, I'm very ashamed of my actions on that night. And yes, if I could take it back, believe me, I would. When we were driving back on the 45 Beltway, I could finally comprehend just how hammered I was. My vision was blurry and I was starting to lose my senses, but hey, I was feeling great. Why pull over, right? Big mistake. After getting off the Beltway, I was in an intersection and about to turn to the adjacent street. And that's when a car coming from the other adjacent street pulled out in front of me which caused me to nearly make impact with it. I was able to swerve out of the way just in time, however due to the way I was angled I went over a curb into a nearby ditch which caused the car to flip on its head. Me and Ray were luckily fine and we got out of the car and both crawled our way out of the ditch. And that's when we noticed that the car we had nearly hit was pulled over, along with another car I had not noticed before. In the first car there was a woman who even in my drunk state of mind I could tell was in shock. And in the second car was a man who I would later find out was the girl's boyfriend. He was incredibly pissed and while I called my mom and let her know what happened and that luckily nobody was hurt. Meanwhile Ray tried to apologize to the man whose name we later found out was Chris. And tell him that it was just a terrible accident and that his girlfriend didn't turn when she was supposed to. Chris was just super pissed and he refused to hear it. My mom scolded me a bit for drinking and driving as she should have. We finished the conversation after she told me to call the police and make an accurate record of the incident to them, and that she was on her way with me to wait with me and Ray. I walked back over to Ray and at this point Chris had already walked back over to his car, and me and Ray decided to talk about what had just happened and what our next course of action should be. We were both still pretty shit faced but we could still tell it was probably not a good idea to get Chris any more angry than he already was as he was acting a bit psycho. After sitting there for a while, that's when me and Ray started to notice that Chris was starting to make his way back over to us. Chris looked even more pissed than before, and he had a wild look on his face. One of menace and true disdain. That's also when we noticed that he was now wearing brass knuckles. Me and my friend didn't understand the severity of the situation, probably due to our haziness of being drunk. Chris then started to scream at both of us yet again yelling many obscenities towards us. Ray then got up and attempted to calm Chris down, but he was not interested in talking anymore and wanted to fight. 
which was something neither me or Ray were looking for. Chris was probably about 6 foot 2 and 210 pounds while I'm 5'10 and about 160 pounds. My friend Ray being about the same height and weight as me. So the height and weight advantage obviously goes to Chris. And we were also nowhere near the right condition to be fighting as we were drunk as hell. As soon as Ray got up and approached Chris in an attempt to calm him down, Chris swung his right hand with the brass knuckle on it into Ray's chin. I heard a loud crack and Ray began to stumble backwards and that's when Chris began to punch Ray again and again, causing Ray to fall on the ground with a loud thud. Ray attempted to get back on his feet and defend himself, but every time Chris would punch him again and again either in the face or in the stomach. I was honestly perplexed of what I should do. I had no idea what my next action should be. I knew that I could not just sit there and watch my friend get the life beaten out of him, as he had already taken several direct hits from brass knuckles at this point, and was now bleeding pretty badly from his face. But at the same time, what could I really do? I feel awful saying this, but there was honestly nothing I was able to do. I was too wasted to really be efficient in getting him off of Ray and all of this was happening so fast I could barely comprehend it. So like a deer in the headlights I just sat there and watched. And I know some of you would say you could have at least tried, but you try to take on a man as large as Chris when you can barely even stand straight. I was hopelessly watching my friend not being able to fight back as he was also extremely intoxicated. This man knew that and took advantage of the situation. Chris actually ended up hitting Ray so hard in the head that he started to have a fucking seizure. The scene was so violent it caused me to puke my guts out. Chris eventually eased off of Ray but then he focused attention on me. I will never forget what he said to me. I'm going to hit you hard enough in your throat to collapse your esophagus and make you choke on your own blood. Then think of something more brutal to finish off your friend. I swear to god this truly sick fuck and demented man actually said all of that with a slight chuckle, which gave me goosebumps and the fact that he said that in a serious tone cultivated me in wanting to throw up again. I thought that that was it and this man was about to kill me and then my friend. I was still just sitting there on the curve like the helpless thing that I was, and then like a godsend a car pulled up towards me with its headlights shining right on me. It was my mom. I can only imagine the emotion she must have felt as she saw this scene. Her son sitting on a curve, dazed with vomit all over him, while his friend was sitting in a pile of his own blood half dead on the concrete pavement, all the while as a looming figure wearing brass knuckles just stood there idling. This did not bother Chris though as just as my mom was about to get out of the car, Chris walked up to me kicking me straight in the face, the force making me fall backwards. Surprisingly I was not in a lot of pain probably due to the alcohol that was numbing the pain. My mom came out of the car screaming at Chris to stop and that's when I told her through my drunken haze to stay away, as I didn't want her to get hurt even if it meant that Chris was about to make good on his plans to violently murder me. My mom however did not listen and kept coming forward, repeatedly yelling at Chris to stop. Chris however would only tell my mom to leave it alone and that this was between me and him. By this point Chris was strong arming me and had already used blunt force on me several times in various parts of my body. It was then that I realized that neither me or Ray ever had a chance to call the police, so this entire time no one was really on their way to help us besides my mom. So barely coherently I yelled at my mom to call them. My mom took out her phone and told Chris that she was calling the police, then proceeded to keep screaming at him to stop beating on her son. Chris then yelled back at my mom. Bitch, you better not call the police or I'll kill your son and then I'll kill you. And then turned towards the facer and then started over in her direction. I immediately noticed what he was doing and told this piece of shit that he was not to lay a single fucking finger on my mother. In summing up all of my strength, I managed to lay a punch straight into this man's nose causing him to let out a loud grunt. That one punch managed to do a lot of damage and his nose was now oozing blood. Me and Chris then proceeded to have a struggle with neither one of us really getting any good hits on each other, but I had just realized that I was the only person standing between him and my mother, and adrenaline was pulsing through my veins as I told myself that I didn't care if this man killed me. This sick motherfucker was not about to hurt my sweet innocent mother who was only in this situation because of me. Through all of the commotion, my mother had made the call to the police and had given them our location. If you're wondering why nobody else noticed what was going on and phoned the police already, 
That's because the area we were at was rather secluded and it was also an ungodly time at night. So ironically, we were in the perfect spot for something like this to happen. The police had showed up about 10 minutes later and by this time Chris had tired himself out by wailing on me and he eventually gave up. He then casually walked back over to his girlfriend while trying to adjust his shattered nose. His girlfriend, in case you're wondering, was still just sitting in her car watching everything the whole time doing absolutely nothing. All the while her crazy ass boyfriend assaulted two people and attempted to attack a third person. A part of me believes that she was just as batshit crazy as Chris, but an even greater suspicion I have is that due to how violent Chris was to two total strangers, I wouldn't be surprised if this girl was physically abused by him and therefore was too scared to call for help. Now that this maniac was out of the way, my mom came to me immediately hugging me. And that's when I told her I was fine and that she needed to check on Ray. And from what my mom told me, Ray looked to be barely alive with both eyes swollen shut and blood spewing from multiple gashes on his face. It was insane. A deputy who we will call Deputy Rick approached Chris and his girlfriend first and then eventually made his way talking to my mom. Chris must have somehow spun the situation in his favor because basically this man made it out to seem like everything that happened to us was all of our fault and that we deserved it because we were drunk. He didn't explicitly say this but that's basically what he implied. Deputy Rick also said that me and my friend would be charged. Me with a DUI and Ray with public intoxication. Needless to say, my mom was pissed at this man for not even caring that her son and his friend were nearly beaten to death, and she tried to explain that to him, but he was acting like an arrogant prick the entire time. Me and Ray were brought to the hospital, and I was discharged later that night, as my injuries were not as severe as Ray's, who was in the hospital for a couple of days following the incident. We would later find out that Chris was brought in but not charged with anything. He got off, apparently on a technicality. The entire situation seemed to be pretty biased towards me and Ray. We know that what we did was wrong and we shouldn't have been under the influence, but that girl also made an illegal turn out in front of us when we had the rite of passage. So it wasn't entirely our fault. Not to mention that gave Chris no right for the actions he took that night to nearly kill both me and Ray. There's a lot of minor details that I'm leaving out for personal reasons, but just know that we were being treated unjust by Deputy Rick and his department. However, the story doesn't end entirely on a bad note. It was later uncovered that Deputy Rick was falsifying DUIs against people who were actually innocent. So this meant that all of his cases, including mine and Ray's, were thrown out as they were considered to be tampered with. We don't know all of the logistics of how far reaching this corruption case was, but it involved multiple people in the precinct. As for Chris, years later my mom found him on Facebook and discovered that he had ironically been arrested for drinking and driving. Funny, the same thing he had nearly killed both me and my friend over years ago. Fuck you, Chris. Number 2. Crazy Biker Stalker by Donovan E. I am a 45-year-old male who lives in a small rural community in Wyoming. I believe there's only about 6,000 people that live in my community. You would never imagine in a town as small as this one that anybody would have to worry about having a stalker, or at least I didn't think so. That was until much to my horror I discovered I had one. Let me preface this by saying until I became a published author back in 2013. I was just another friendly face in the crowd, so to speak. Granted, I am well known in my community because I work at the local hospital and have for many years. At the time, I was working as the training coordinator for the front office staff for our medical clinic, as well as the hospital. Getting my first book published generated a great deal of press in my hometown and statewide. The fact that I quickly rose to a 5-star rating on Amazon only generated more press and interviews therefore more attention. Then when my second book came out in 2015, all of a sudden I was like this local celebrity. Being somewhat humble, I was appreciative that the publicity helped me sell a lot of books, but I was uncomfortable with all of the attention. Local folks would come to the hospital just to have me sign their books. This is where my stalker story began. On this particular day, I'm up in our medical office building where I'm training a new hire when a rather large biker dude with long stringy blonde hair and covered in tattoos approached the front counter where I was standing. 
I smiled and greeted him with a warm hello and how can I help you? I was under the impression he was there to check in for an appointment. He smiled and admitted that he did not have an appointment that day, but was wondering if I would autograph the copies of my books that he had with him. Not wanting to be rude, I said I would be more than happy to, and had him follow me down to the end of the counter so that we wouldn't be in anybody's way. To be honest, I was a bit surprised that he bought them, considering they were gay-themed supernatural thrillers. I guess he just didn't strike me as the type of guy that would read anything that was gay-themed. Regardless, I thanked him for purchasing the books and signed them for him. He thanked me and left, and I didn't give it any more thought. Until a few weeks later, he showed up at the hospital where I was again at the front desk doing some training, and asked me to sign two more books he said he had purchased for a friend. I again thanked him and signed the books. Fast forward a few months and I'm filling in as the receptionist for one of our other clinics in a small town, about 30 miles away from my hometown. The receptionist scheduled to work had called in sick that day and I agreed to fill in for her. It was shortly after lunch when guess who walks in with both of my books in his hands? None other than Mr. Biker. Being at work, I remained polite and again signed his book and he was on his way. Feeling truly creeped out and concerned, I spoke with the nurse on duty as well as the provider and expressed my concerns. They dismissed it as nothing other than an obvious fan who must have had a little crush and nothing more. I figured they were probably right and went about my day. The weeks went by and I began to notice this large guy hanging out in front of my house and in the back alley behind it. He always wore a hoodie and so I couldn't see who it was. I pointed this out to my husband who reminded me that with the house up for sale he was probably just someone who was either interested in buying it or a looky loo. Then one day my mother who lives across the alley from me called me while I was out of town on a book tour to tell me some strange guy in a hoodie was casing my house and peering in the windows. I told her it was probably just a potential buyer and not to worry about it. Fast forward a few months. I'm back at the medical office building in our urgent care training another new hire when I get a call from one of the girls in central scheduling. She tells me she has a guy on the line who keeps calling and asking for me but refuses to identify himself or why he needs to speak to me. Thinking that it was a patient that had an issue of a more sensitive nature, I told her to go ahead and patch him through. Introducing myself, I asked him how I could help him. I quickly discovered he was not needing an appointment nor did he have any medical concerns. He began telling me he was naked and jerking off. He wanted me to know that he was thinking of me, and he began to tell me all of the sick and twisted things he was going to do to me if he ever got me alone. I was just thinking, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? I was flipping the fuck out at this point, but somehow still managed to keep my voice calm and inform the pervert to never call me again, otherwise I would notify the police. Unbeknownst to me, the clinic manager was standing behind me and asked me what was going on. I explained the phone call and what the creep said. The manager was concerned and felt we needed to notify the police immediately. I met with a few officers and explained what had happened. They asked me if I might know who the person was, but at the time I had no clue who it was. The next morning I received a call from a local detective who asked me if I would stop by his office before I went to work. He said he had more information on the guy who called me the day before. I agreed to meet him and called the clinic manager to let him know what was going on and that I would be in as soon as I was done talking with the detective. Upon reaching his office, I was invited in and the detective got up from his desk and shut the door. He informed me that they did a search of the number the guy called in from and came up with some rather disturbing information. He went on to explain that after learning who the guy was, the detective had done some digging, including interviewing some of the folks this guy associates with. What the detective told me next made all of my hair on my body stand on end and sent my heart crashing to the floor. I was informed that this guy had been watching or stalking me rather for over six months. Not only that, but he believes the guy has been in my house. I was shaking with fear and was finding it hard to breathe. I began to pace the floor of this rather small office. I explained that I don't even have a clue who this guy is or what he looks like. That is when the detective turned his computer monitor around and showed who it was. It was the biker dude. My blood ran cold and I felt like I was going to pass out. When I could collect myself, I began to explain how he has been in my yard, the front and the back. He has been sitting in front of my house on the street. I also told him I have seen him walking up and down the alley between my mother's house and mine. 
The detective informed me that this guy was a well-known gang and drug dealer from California and has been living in my hometown dealing drugs here for a year now. He told me I need to make sure all of my doors and windows are locked at all times, and always have somebody walk me to my vehicle and never go anywhere alone. He said this guy has been accused of threatening to kill a witness in previous drug offenses, and that is why he was still on the street, so to speak. Then much to my surprise and horror, the detective asked me if I would be willing to befriend this guy, and help the cops set up a drug sting operation. I was mortified and angry to say the least. I told him I needed time to absorb all this and get back to him. My manager and the CEO of the hospital met with me when I got to work that day, and I told him everything. An organization-wide email went out with the guy's picture, along with an alert asking that the CEO, clinic manager, and I be notified if the creep was spotted in any of the facilities. We're a small hospital, so to speak, so we have no security. Two weeks went by and things seemed to calm down. My husband and I had gone out for the evening and reminded our roommate that if he left the house, to be sure all of the doors were locked. We had already made him aware of the situation. He had seen the guy sitting in front of the house on several occasions but just shrugged it off. I needed to get out for a bit because I felt like a trapped rat. It was a great night and for a while I was able to forget about the whole thing. Upon returning to the house, much to my relief, the front door was still locked. I walked through the house to the back door and it was also locked. Our roommate was sound asleep in his room. I breathed a sigh of relief and made my way to the bedroom. As I walked into the room, I noticed my husband was reading something and he was white as a sheet. I asked him what was wrong and he handed me a sheet of paper saying this was under your pillow. Then he got up and then began looking in the closets and under the bed. He then went through the entire house while I read in horror. It was a letter, and this is what it said. Hello, sexy. This is a nice house you have here. I absolutely love the smell of your pillow. I hope you don't mind, but I borrowed a few of your sexy things. I will return them when I have added my own scent to them. Don't bother contacting the police. I know when your mother is home alone. I also know your roommate's schedule as well as your husband's. By the way, your roommate is a very sound sleeper. I'll be seeing you soon. I called the police, but they said there was nothing they could do since he was no longer in the house and I could not prove it was him because he never signed the note. I was shitting bricks because I still couldn't figure out how he had gotten in. Another few weeks go by and I begin to realize I'm seeing him everywhere. At the grocery store, the pharmacy, I mean everywhere I went he was always there lurking in the distance. It had gotten to the point I was now on medications to help me sleep and antidepressants because I felt like I was losing my mind. I couldn't function because the cops kept saying that they couldn't do anything about it unless he harmed me or was caught in my home. Sitting in front of my house for hours on end or in the alley is not illegal. This went on for over a year. When I work a professional job, I maintained my bubbly outward appearance in public, but I hid like a timid little mouse behind the locked doors at night too afraid to leave my house. One night about six months ago, my husband and I awoke to lights flashing and people hollering outside. It sounded like they were right outside on the front lawn. Peeking through the drapes, I discovered they were right outside. They had some guy on the ground ordering him not to move. The fire department was there putting a large 15 gallon gas can that had been lit on fire and placed on my front step. We threw on our robes and rushed outside where we were met by several police officers. They had the biker guy on the ground in cuffs. One of the officers informed me that the neighbor across the street called reporting a suspicious character lurking in my front yard, and he was carrying what appeared to be a rather large can of gas. The officer also pointed out that all of the tires on my car had been slashed. He went on to explain that the biker dude had placed the can of gas on my front step and lit it on fire. My heart was pounding so hard in my chest I thought I was going to literally die of a massive coronary right there. I lost it and broke down sobbing. My husband on the other hand blew up. He was beyond angry. I was too, but I was too overwhelmed with the fact that had our neighbors not been up and called the police, we could have been killed. Biker dude is now behind bars but was only sentenced to two years on a plea deal. The scariest thing about that is the police nor the state is required to notify me in the event this creep is released. So Mr. Biker Dude, I pray and pray hard we never meet again.
Number 3. Home Invasion by Devin W. My name is Devin and I'm from Western Indiana. This incident happened in January 2013. At the time, I was only 14 going on 15. I'm now 20. One early morning, I was visiting my cousin. They had to leave to go to Indianapolis for a doctor's appointment and I couldn't go because I was doing online school at the time and had to be at home at the time of the classes. It started out as any other day, really. Nothing out of the ordinary. I would occasionally let out the family dog in between classes and get something to eat. At about 11 a.m., I had my headset on in a class when I hear the dog going crazy. I think to myself, he must need to go out bad. I guess it won't hurt to step away for a few minutes. Now, the way this house was set up was the basement stairs led right to the back door which had a big window at the top. I open the basement door to head up the stairs when I see movement outside and I realize it's a head and I hear a scratching sound. I head back down the stairs and start to fear for the worst. There's a man trying to break into the home and I don't know what his intentions were. Eventually I hear two very loud bangs and the back door gives way. I didn't have a cell phone and I looked over to see that I also didn't have a home phone downstairs either. So there I was completely vulnerable to whoever was in the house. I then hear the dog go quiet but I hear loud boots stomping on the wooden floor above me. After about two minutes in utter paralyzing fear I decide to try and run out the back door. As I try to move up the stairs I hear the man headed towards the back door and I see him throw a pillow sack full of all of our valuables towards the completely busted back door. I head back down and decide not to risk detection. All I hear for the next 15 minutes is loud bangs and things being thrown at the door. What I'm about to tell you is the absolute worst part of this experience and is one of the main reasons I developed PTSD. I start to hear the boots stomping down the stairs. At this point, my worst fear is that the man is either going to kidnap me or kill me and not get caught. He opens the door and finds me hiding behind the desk. He then proceeds to give me the most dead stare I have ever seen on a person's face and then slams the door shut. Then he books it out of the same door that he came in, leaving everything behind. I shakily head upstairs to find him gone and the house looking like a tornado came through. Chairs were moved, tables tossed, and the couch was even upside down. The master bedroom had also been destroyed. I then was able to call my family who called the police. It turned out he was one of a duo in a string of about seven burglaries in the city. They were later caught by the police after a homeowner spotted their vehicle in his driveway and blocked them in. A few months later after I moved, the detectives followed up with us about the case and I was able to ID the man that came in the house. They were found guilty on all charges. One of them even rode with the police to show them which houses they hit, and they pointed ours out. He then told the officer, I remember that one the most because I saw a kid in there. I don't know how much jail time they got or if they're even still incarcerated. My anxiety has gotten better though and I hope to continue down the path of getting into law enforcement. This not only serves as a nightmarish reminder, but as motivation to continue to chase the dream of becoming an officer. Number 4. I Was Almost Sexually Assaulted by Henry H. It's been over six years since this happened to me, and I think I'm ready to share it. First off, I'm a male, slim, athletic, and around 5'11". I used to be a bit of a party animal and I still kinda am to this day. I'm from Melbourne, Australia and I was 19 when this happened to me. One Friday night I was invited to a house party at a friend's house which later turned into one of the craziest nights of my life. It was a big house with over 300 people. I knew I would be drinking a lot and would probably take part in some drug activities like weed and ecstasy, so I took a train there since I knew I wouldn't be able to drive. It took me at least 30 minutes by train from my house to the closest train station and another 10 minutes walking from the train station to the house. As I expected, there were a few people there already, some of whom I knew and some I was meeting for the first time. As the night progressed, we were all dancing, hanging out in the backyard, having shots, smoking a bong, playing games, etc. It was like this until about 3 in the morning. I could vaguely remember anything since I was drinking and smoking weed and probably had a few other things in my system as well. At that time, the party was showing signs of no shutting down. 
But in my state, I was feeling a bit tired, so I was getting my coat and ready to leave. But most of my friends, as well as the other people, urged me not to leave. So, like the dumbass that I was, I stayed there for a little while longer. I had a few more drinks and smoked some more, as did everyone else. About an hour or two later, I was definitely ready to go back home, so I said goodbye to the people that weren't passed out and made my way to the station. I could have caught a taxi, but I had no money, so I walked to the station's underpass. I will admit the walk did sober me up a bit since I have a high tolerance. On my way to the underpass, I could hear two people arguing. When I got closer, it was a man and a woman. The man was shorter than the woman who was at least the same height as me since she was in high heels. I could hear swearing and suddenly the man slapped the woman. He threw her head against the wall and when she was on the ground he started kicking her. I yelled out, Hey, what the fuck are you doing? As I was getting a little closer. I was going to kick this guy's ass for laying his hands on a woman like that as it was fucking despicable to watch. He stopped beating the woman, looked at me as the woman got up and started running towards my direction. She ran right past me as I locked eyes on her. That was enough time for the guy to come to me and hold a knife to my throat. I was frozen in fear, my heart beating hard, and I felt like I was going to shit myself. The man looked really pissed. His entire face was covered in pure hatred. To describe what he looked like, he looked to be in his early 40s, short black hair, white, and slim build. For the first time since approaching me, he spoke to me. You want to be a hero, huh? He said in a low, cold voice. I didn't answer him. I was too scared to move or speak. He then told me to lay face down on the ground while he still had his knife in his hand. I did what he said and I could hear him pulling his pants down with his other hand. In my mind I knew what he was going to do to me but I didn't know how to get myself out of this situation. Don't struggle bitch, he said to me as he was pulling my pants down. He was now on top of me but before he could do what he wanted to do, he leaned closer to my ear and said, I'm gonna fuck you in the ass so fucking hard. Right before he was going to finish, there was a loud noise that managed to startle him and that's when I headbutted him with the back of my head to his nose. I then pushed him off my back and quickly pulled my pants back up. I ran away as fast and as far as I could, all the while I could hear him yelling at me. I wasn't sure what he said, but I could hear him swearing and running towards me. The sound of him running after me was truly terrifying, but he never caught me. It was a miracle that I got away, especially in the drunk and slightly drugged state I was in. And by another miracle, the train almost left without me, but I quickly made my way in a matter of seconds before the doors closed. By the time the train was moving, the man had emerged from the underpass and was looking at me, with his knife in one hand and my phone in the other. I guess he took my phone without me even realizing it. I was so fucking scared what he was going to do to me, but thanks to my quick thinking, nothing happened to me. I of course got a new phone and deactivated all of my info from the one that was stolen from me so him trying to find me was not going to happen. I find it very strange that something like this could have happened to me since I am male, and to this day I will never ever go to that train station at that hour and in that state ever again. From now on I either catch an Uber or I end up crashing at the party. It's better to be safe at a house party than to wind up raped or murdered. I'm truly lucky to be alive. Thanks for watching guys and I hope you enjoyed today's video. Before we close things out I'd like to give a special thanks and shout out to all of last month's $5 or more patrons who are also featured on screen on the Cannibal Wall of Fame. Goodnight Goosebumps, Babe Lincoln, Jen C, LES, Emily W, Howard R, Catherine M, Carrie F, Matthew B, Random Randy, and Terry H. I'd also like to thank the $3 and up patrons as well which are also featured on screen. Thank you guys so much for supporting me on Patreon. I truly appreciate it a ton. If you'd like to join these fellow cannibals and be added to the Cannibal Wall of Fame, consider heading over to my Patreon page and pledging. For $1 a month you'll get access to my Patreon only blog which includes sneak peeks to all of my videos I'll be working on, along with an occasional video of bloopers. Plus, I'll be posting one exclusive narration video a week there as well. So, that's one extra spooky video a week just for patrons, and that'll never be featured on my channel. 
For $3 a month, you'll get all the rewards previously mentioned, plus you'll have your name featured on the Cannibal Wall of Fame on screen, plus an exclusive role on my Discord server. For $5 a month, you'll get all the rewards previously mentioned, plus a spoken shout-out where I'll thank each one of you personally for pledging as a patron, plus have your name on the Cannibal Wall of Fame. You'll also get access to MP3 downloads of all of my weekly narrations. For $10 a month, you'll get all the rewards previously mentioned, plus an exclusive Patreon-only Discord role where you can interact with me one-on-one -on -one in a voice chat, and occasionally be joined by some other narrators from time to time. For $15 a month, you'll get access to all the rewards previously mentioned, plus another exclusive Discord role where at least once a month you'll get to hang out with me on a live stream on my channel, where we can talk about anything. For $25 a month, you'll get access to all the rewards previously mentioned, plus access to an exclusive Movie Buddies Discord role, where once or twice a month you'll get to join me and other patrons in a voice chat and we'll have a scary horror movie night on Netflix, then talk about it afterwards. You will need a Netflix account for this perk. Last, but certainly not least, for $40 a month you'll get access to all the previous rewards, plus I'll narrate a 30 minute to hour long personal narration video just for you, of anything you'd like. From true scary stories, to creepy pastas to ASMR. So consider checking out my Patreon. I've been working really hard to come up with some cool rewards for you guys that'll not only benefit my channel, but also you guys as well. Thanks for watching everyone, take care, have a good one, and remember.